First Samuel. 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 First Samuel. First Samuel, chapter two, verse twelve. Is what we got up to. So again, guys, yes, the heroes of faith, guys, you know, it's just been beautiful, it's been awesome, it's been wonderful. The one, you know, some of the some one that there's been so many different wonderful, wonderful truths of beauty, the beautiful things we've been able to see through these classes. Um, you know, to understand that, you know, these heroes of faith, what makes them a hero? This question, what makes them a hero? They believe. What does that mean? Okay, thank you. They believe what God said is the way that it was. Yes? They trusted him. They didn't trust in themselves. They didn't trust in their works. They didn't trust in anything else. They trusted that God was going to do his works. Despite them. Yes? Not too spite this way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway. All right. Anyways, uh, no, guys, you know, it's the revelation over and over and over again. There's so much hope, yeah? And uh, again, guys, uh, last week we had another uh, woman, mother of faith, yes? And uh, we got to see her standing on her just believing the promises of God. Uh, we got to see um, her husband, um, Elkanah, who also uh, believed in the Lord. Uh, practice the, the, the sacrifice, and again, what's the representation of that sacrifice? So we know the physical, we know physically what took place. Yes, everybody knows physically what took place in the sacrifice, right? They would take a lamb that was without blemish. If I can just get so straight to the point, they would build a fire, put rocks around it, build a fire, and they would take a sheet that was without blemish, and they would cut his throat right over it and spill the blood out right there on that fire. Sorry for the whip city. <laughs> um, immediately what it would do though is it would cause smoke to rise up into the air. Yes? And that smoke, the Lord said it was a sweet smelling savor because it covered what he could smell from all of us, which was all of our sins. Yes? And that sacrifice had to be performed over and over and over and over and over again. You know why? You never actually paid for anything. Yes? And yet what we found was that in Hebrews. But we found that that's why the sacrifice of Jesus Christ happened once and it never happened again. Because he has actually paid for our sins. And all the other sacrifice was nothing more than a message, a testimony, a representation to those individuals that were performing it of the reality that he was going to do that for their, for their, I'm sorry, for their salvation. Yes? And so they walked it by faith in acting out that ceremony. Does that make sense? And so we had last week, guys, come back into first Samuel. What we had was we had Jephthah, who lives at home with his wife and wives, sorry, um, his two wives, and um, every year they would go in and perform the sacrifice. Yes? And we had Eli, who was the priest, and his sons served him. Served him. Served Eli. Okay? But Eli was the priest. Yes? And they would go in every single year and they would perform these sacrifices. And one of the ladies, let me get the names here for sure. We have Hannah, who was the one who was the first wife, yes, and she was barren and was unable to have children. Okay, and every year when they when they would go, um, Penanea, which was the second wife who was able to bear children, would always make sure to poke at the first wife to get her really upset that she was unable to have children. And so you know, guys, she ends up. Okay, maybe I should stop real quick on that. Um, Somebody asked last week about the double sacrifice. So what happened is Elkanah would give Hannah double the amount of sacrifice than what he would give Hannah and all of the children. Right? Um, would, you know, instead of the uh, would would arouse her anger spitefully and things like that, what do you what do you think are things that she would say? So you're going there to worship God and you're praying to the Lord. Yes? You think Hannah ever prayed for children before this day? Okay. Yeah, she, I mean, like, it, it's what you do. I mean, like, it's what they did. And it's obvious that Hannah believed God because of everything that we hear after this. Yes? And all the things that she does for Samuel. Yes? So it's evident that she really did believe God, so she would have been praying for these things. And guys, it would have been, that's normal. And again, the way that they look at things at that time is if you were shut up and that was God, they'd be like, getting you for something. Yes? You think Penny you think may have ever said, like, see, look, God's getting you. I don't love you. Yeah? And then that double sacrifice. So why the double sacrifice? It wasn't to actually atone for something double. 
But I think it was for Elkanah to let her know that he loved her. And he loved her more, and that the children they had to do with his love for her or God's love for her. So it was done. Yeah? And so it was really for her faith. So what we had was we had Hannah who comes in, and uh, you know, they're eating dinner that night, and Hannah leaves. She doesn't drink, she doesn't eat, she gets up from the table and she leaves. She ends up going to the table. And she falls down on her knees and she starts praying. But as she's praying, she's not saying a word out loud, but her neck lips are moving. And Eli is laying over on the steps, off on a pillar somewhere, over to the side, sees her. He's the priest. He turns over to Hannah and he says, Listen, woman, can't you stay sober at any point in time? Get out of here with your drunkenness. And what her response is, is that I, I'm not drunk. Not even, not even one, she says, uh, not one drop of wine or any other. Which I don't know if you know the others would have been that she could have been drinking to get her something wrong. <laughs> but or any other um, type of drink that would make her that way. So um, she said, but what I am doing is I am praying to God. And Eli, it kind of, it's almost like Eli's like just trying to get rid of her. And Eli is almost like, listen, may God just bless whatever you're saying, so get out of here. Go back to your husband. And uh, so she walks in faith, though. She believes that God's going to answer the promise. Or answer, I'm sorry, the request. Yeah? Uh, what we end up finding out is, is that indeed God did hear her. Uh, she, she became pregnant uh, and says that she, that she knew, that Elinon knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her, and it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived for a son. And in his name, she called Samuel, which meant that God heard me. Yes? And so Samuel is born. Now in that, she had promised in her prayer that if you would give me a son, I will loan him. I will loan him to you, God, for a little while. I'll loan him to you for the rest of his life. But it's a loan, because in the end, he's still going to be mine. And that, you know, as the beauty of her faith in that was that where is she going to see him again? In glory, with God. And then there, what was he always going to be to her? Her son. Sorry. I think that's just such a beautiful stance of faith for her and a woman who has gone all that time without being able to have a child, and then all of a sudden it does, and to follow through on that promise, and to live it that way, that God's promises are true. Yeah? And so you see that she believed. Um, Elkanah, it comes to time again for them to go back and perform the sacrifices. He says, come on, let's go drop off a child like you promised to God. You promised me, let's go do this. You know, we don't make these promises in vain. And um, she says, no, you wait until at least get done it, and I wean him until he's done suffering. And then once he's weaned, then we will take him and we'll give him to the priest. So Elkanah turns and he says, you know what, wife, you do whatever's well in your heart. But this thing you must do. Remember what it was. Establish God's word. What does it mean to establish? It's, it is that way. It is firm. It is going to be that way. There's no other way for it. It is established. It's that way forever. Yes? And you establish God's what? Like what? Good. Don't cut those. God's promises. Yes? I mean, guys, think about all the promises that we've already heard. One of the grandest of all of the promises that we've already heard. That there was going to be one who would come, a seed that was going to come. Yes? And that he would be a blessing that he would blot out, that he would take away and remember no more all of our sins. He would be our Savior. Yes? And this promise has been passed down since Abraham. Remember, old Abraham and Sarah. Remember, around and around, telling everybody they were married, trying to get all the other kings and all the other countries killed. You remember them? But what they did do is they were they went, they confessed, and they ended up having a terrible story of what God had done. And in that, they would, they would perform a sacrifice right outside those cities. And every single time that happens, they grow. The church grows. People get saved. People start following and start following in their promise. Plus, we see. Many, many generations later, that even in these other towns, the people had remembered those words. Other promises. God promised to take them to a what kind of land? He promised it to Abraham, and he also promises it to generations that come after Abraham. What did he tell them that they would be inherit? The promised land. The promised land. A land of milk and honey. A land that was of God and not of this world. Yes? Now, there is the physical sense of 
geographically of Jericho and when they go in, yes, and all of that. But it was all about the spiritual of what was really in God, yes? Every single one of those steps. Those promises, she's the believing that her and her son are going to have that land, yes? So the exhortation in this mothers is this. Now, he, mothers of faith, establish the words of God, not your own words, not their words, not anybody else's words. Establish God's words with your children. That is what will make you a beautiful mother and a hero of faith. Okay? And by the way, when the dad says this to her, her son was yet but a few months old. So when do you start? As early as, as, early as you can believe yourself, then establish. Yeah? So for some of us, that might be however old you are. But if it's real in your heart of what he's done, and you establish that as a fact for your child, then God will say that you are a woman of faith, and you are a hero of faith. And you are a mother of faith. And guys, that's beautiful. So moms, establish the words of God. Amen? Follow these other heroes of faith as an example. Yeah? They weren't perfect people. And what they did do was hold the promises. And they share those promises. And guys, I told you already, we skipped over the book of Ruth because it's not one that's listed in that there. But again, another area there where you have multiple women of faith that are standing on the promises of God and sharing these promises of God with each other and others. Yeah? And so you have this over and over and over again. So ladies, then preach the gospel. Hold on to the truth, preach the gospel, bring it to your children. All right? Now, what we end up getting to is a beautiful prayer by Hannah. We walked that through last week. And just the, again, everything that you need to know about God, His salvation, His love, is all right there in that one prayer, which was chapter 2, verses 1 through really 10. Um, now, in 11, it says, Now, and all went to his, his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to, to the Lord, and he served to the Lord before Eli the priest. Okay? So now where we were at with the first 12. So here we go. Ready? No. First Samuel. First Samuel chapter two. No, I said that about Ruth. No, I'm sorry. But my, my Jim, when I said that was is that you know I'm just I'm just establishing all of these women of faith that stood for truth, that stood for belief. And so because last week was really focused on him, and that's so the review in that, and because she Ruth is not listed, nor is um what's the other lady there? Oh my gosh. Naomi? Um, is not mentioned specifically by name. We did not read that because we're going based on the heroes that are listed right there. But again, there's many others, was my point. And so, I, you know, the exhortation that I want for all of us throughout this is for all of us to find inspiration. Whether we're men, whether we're women, whether we're good, whether we're bad, whether we make big mistakes, little mistakes, and everything in between. Because if we're big centers, little centers, um, you know, at this point, I mean, we've had great people, we've had prostitutes, we've had murderers, we've had, you know, psychos that, like, would rip bodies apart. I mean, we've had, like, all kinds of different things that God took and used them to say, don't you? Right? And so no matter who we are, we can stop looking at ourselves and still we can look to his God. Yes? And we can look to him for our salvation, we can look to him for our power, our strength. Okay? And so women, the exhortation is just do the same. So today, though, guys, I want to try to push through this. And so it's a lot of reading, so please try to stay with me. If you have a question, go ahead and stop me. But I'm going to try to push as hard as I can, and I'll make mention of certain things here and then. Okay, but the history that takes place in this is important for the setup of Samuel and his ministry, and kind of understanding the flow of how things into this. So he's been dropped off there, um, and um, immediately uh, is being trained, if you will. Okay? Now, the sons of Eli, if you remember them, they were mentioned once before as being evil and corrupt. So, again, they were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. They were raised under Eli, just like Samuel's going to be. And for all the things that Eli did wrong, he did raise Samuel. And Samuel ends up being the only prophet, judge, and priest. Yes? And so for all the things you, you know, look, I'm sorry, I've just heard different people say at times about Eli because of his sons. There ain't no doubt. It's not great how that part ends up happening, okay? Yet at the same time, guys, the point is this. Parents raise your children in faith. But the Lord says to each generation, it is unto them. The Lord reaches for all generations, but each generation is theirs. You're not going to be able to make it better. 
Charles Reardon say that I believe that's real, is that every generation has to find God for themselves. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is. And I think he's taking that from that scripture there. He says that for each generation is their own. They have they have to find him. You know, but we have to testify to them in order Amen. to find him. Amen. Yes. And so unfortunately it says right here that his sons did not know the Lord, but Samuel did. And Samuel ends up being raised by Eli, a son of him, if you will. He's raised right by him. So it doesn't always work out exactly the way that we think it should, but God has all things in him and we'll just push on. All right, here we go. The priest. The priest's custom with the people was that when a man offered a sacrifice, that the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh of it. You know what those look like, right? For me. You know, they would come over to the boiling pot and they would thrust it into the pan, kettle, cauldron, pot, or whatever it was that they were cooking in. And the priest would take for himself all that the flesh was brought up. So they did so in Shiloh and to all of the Israelites who came there. So if you get this, when the priest was hungry, and there were those that were performing the sacrifices, once certain things took place in that sacrifice, there usually was also one in which they would eat themselves and cook. So by whatever means they cooked it, if the priest was hungry, he would walk over with the three-pronged hook and reach in and snag whatever it cooked. If it was a little bit, that was his portion. If it was a big amount, that was his portion. And the priest would take that. The boys, who were servants of Eli, okay, they would do it to every person that came. Whether they needed it, didn't need it. Yeah? Okay, so they did show you. So also before, they burned the fat. The priest's servant, the priest's servant, would come and say to the man who sacrificed, give me for roasting to the priest, for he will not Take the oil of meat from you, but he wants it raw. And if the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires. He would then answer him, no, but you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. By the way, uh, for different things like, you know, from just even sicknesses and illnesses and things like that, what should you do with people? I mean, like, you know what I mean? So, like, they're just really just being, they're just being turds. I'm being nice. They're just being turds. Okay. Um, therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the men abhorred the offering, they hated the offerings of God. They're really insulting God because what that offering was all about was a representation of Jesus Christ, and they didn't care about that. They didn't care about the people. They didn't care about what the people felt about the offering. Yeah. Now it jumps. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. That's all he wore. Linen around. Linen around. Moreover, so because of that, his mother used to make him a little robe. And every year she would bring him a robe that she had made when she came up for the yearly sacrifice. Because all he had was a little paper, and I'm sure that he'd be kind of cold. Just that little piece of linen. So Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that you have given to the Lord, which was sin. Then they would go to their own house. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived, and she bore three more sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child of sin grew before the Lord, which I think is so beautiful. It's not just telling him that he grew up, he got old. But what he grew in was he grew in the Lord. Yeah. Now, Eli was very old, and he heard everything that his sons did to the Israel, and how they laid even with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Understand. So there were different religions around that period. And even if you go back to the judges, one of the things that gets different groups at the different times of those different judges in trouble was them worshiping other gods. Yes? One of those gods, who ends up getting picked up many years later by the Corinthian church of the gospel back then, is a sexual god in which if you wanted to have anything, 
then you would have to sleep with a priest or a priestess. Okay? So they had a priest for the women and a priestess for the men. And so if you want to have good crops, you would have to go have sex with these priests or priestess. Okay? So it was a whole religion that was built around this, yes? These boys manipulated and twisted things that were not even the faith of the Israelites for their own purpose. Okay? So he said to them, why do you do such things? For I fear of your evil dealings from all the people. I hear, I'm sorry, of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Did you hear the statement? Because it is a big, big statement. If a man sins against another man, who's the judge over those things? God is. But if a man sins against God, then who will intercede for him? Only Christ will be the only one who can intercede for him, yes? But what are these sons making a mockery of? The message of Jesus Christ. They don't care about the message of Jesus Christ. They don't care about the people who are trying to bring that message of Jesus Christ. Do you understand the severity of this situation in the eyes of Eli for his sons? And what is Eli trying to do for his sons right now? He is trying to intercede before they get too far down the road. Of, because when would be too far? Huh? When they die. He doesn't want them to get to that point. And who knows how long they're going to live? Only God. So Eli, hearing these things and understanding the direction that his sons are going and how they're really walking and treading the blood of Christ on their foot, he's doing everything he can to step in there in his mind at this moment. Yes? He's trying to redirect them. He's trying to bring them down some sort of reality. Nevertheless, they would not heed him. I'm sorry, they would not heed the voice of their father because the Lord had already desired to kill them. The spirit was already gone. It was already too late. Now Eli doesn't know that. So Eli did do what he ought to do. Which was bring the truth and try to direct. Yes? Everybody here? You ever with me on that? Yes. Now the child, Samuel, grew in stature and also in faith, they were both between, before the Lord and before men. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, There is another translation that says, An angel of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to you? To, I'm sorry. Reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house. And I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear the death before me. Did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I commanded in my dwelling place? And honor your sons more than you honor me. Make yourself fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel. My Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, Far be it for me. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me, I will lightly esteem. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that they will not be an old man in your house. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God has done for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart. And all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall both die. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to, to what is in my heart and in my mind. 
I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and say, Please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. So as a prophetic happening right now, yes? Of what is to come. Uh, Eli tells them they did not heed him. Then this comes to pass. What can Eli have done? Kill them. Kill them. You know, guys, what he did not do is he did not make sure it stopped. He allowed them to continue to do those things to be offered. He allowed them to continue to do those things. And that's where you see this fall. Yeah? And yes, he can tell them, which is so beautiful. We can discipline him, we can't do anything. There was nothing he needed for us, and then just say, hey, listen, you need to stop. Yeah? And so he wants that, you know what, is you should show me more respect instead of trying to show them respect by not. Yeah? So, uh, Yeah. Do not try to blow Christ in their foot. Yeah. Do not count the blood of Christ as a common thing. Love the Lord thy God. Yes. Love one another. Where are these things with these boys? So they knew, they knew. Yes, they were raised up in Eli. They knew. And then when, we, when we get further into Samuel's life, you got to understand, a lot of those things that were Samuel had to be given to him. Like, he had to have heard these things. Yes? Where would he have heard these things? Eli. From Eli, yes? So, as far as the hearing part, you know, the knowledge side, it was there, yes? But the treading Christ on the foot, all those different things, again, where, where was it? Because of that, they know the Lord. You know, like, so the statements that you see is written right here in the book of Samuel about these young men. Yeah? Um, very, very straightforward, very, very important. Yeah? You don't want to ever show the blood of Christ in their foot. Yeah? Don't count the covenant of his blood as a common thing. Yeah? You know, guys, we get to hear day in, day out, week in, week out right here about what Christ has done. Don't consider that to be a common thing. Yeah? Um, and guys, there's people that literally desire to be here to hear and cannot. And in that, though, you know, the thing that's kind of neat for some of those is, is they hold on to words. They hold on to the words of God a lot when they consider them more precious because we've been hearing them in the sermon. They're more precious. And guys, for us that are here, we need to. We need to hold them precious. Yes? We need to see that they are, you know, and not counted as nothing. You know, uh, good. Chapter 3. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. So, what's not happening? God's was not being preached, at least not far and wide. Yes? So, Shiloh, right there where Eli is at, yes? But it says that it was it was rare in those days that it was not widespread, so it wasn't being spread out. Yes? Uh, and it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, that when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of the God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, it was before that happened, that the Lord called to Samuel. We went over this and over this and over this. When God calls, what do you say? Here I am. Here I am. <laughs> yeah? So here's little Samuel, little tiny boy, yes? So, use your imagination. Hopefully, some of us still have it. You have your room. Eli's got his room down the hallway. There's a bathroom in between. 
bed. You lay down and you sleep in. He lies snoring. And all of a sudden, everything kind of just gets quiet. And all of a sudden, you hear, there you being called. Samuel. So what does Samuel say? Here I am. And he jumped up and he ran to Eli. And he said, here I am, for you called me. By the, by the way, uh, with your children, when you call your children, make sure they say, here I am, and they run, come running. Yeah. It's good practice. It works for Samuel. Yeah? He says, here I am, you called me. And Eli turns and says, I did not call you, call me now, little boy, I'm asleep. It's not bothering me. Sounds like me. Sounds like me. That's why I got to handle all those other things. That's good, right? Oh my God, no, come on. Go to bed. Leave me alone. You're supposed to be a long time ago. Go to sleep. Stop coming in. No, okay, I'm sorry. He says, I did not call. Lie down again. And so he went and he lay down. Then the Lord yet called again. Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. And he answered, he said, boy, I did not call you. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and he went to Eli and he said, here I am, for you did call me. You did call me. He's like, add this in there this time. You did it. He didn't call me. And Eli, all of a sudden, Eli perceived. And it's the Lord who is calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, You go and lay down, and it shall be that if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears you. So Samuel went and he lay down in his place. I wonder what he'd be like. Would you be scared? Would you be excited? I would be scared. <laughs> you know, I, I tell you what, when I was, when I really did know the Lord was really calling me, it was yeah, scary. Yeah? Uh, humbling and scary. It's very emotional and like beautiful, but yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> now, mine wasn't as graceful and beautiful as me as this necessarily, but nonetheless. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. So now the Lord came and stood and called as at the other times. Samuel, Samuel. And actually it's an exclamation point, so. Samuel, Samuel. So you guys are And Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at, with, at which both ears of everyone who hears, it will tingle. I'm going to do something for Israel, and everybody who hears it, their ears, are going In that day, I will perform, though, against Eli, all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he, has, which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and he said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word the Lord has spoken to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me, of all the things that he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything, and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. And Eli said, It is the Lord. Let him do what he sees good unto him. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. Not, not even. He didn't tread the blood of Christ on the foot. He kept every single word. Yes, he kept it in his heart. He didn't let, let it fall. Yeah? In all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again 
in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. So immediately he starts preaching. Yes? Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped besides Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped in Hophet. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes, when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people said to Shiloh that they might bring from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Alphoni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines became very afraid. And so they said, God has come into this camp. And they said, Woe to all of us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians in the place of the wilderness. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was a great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Oboni and Phinehas, died. If you remember, if you back up, guys, and so you know the, the different representations and all and all this. So he said uh, before that the ark. How do we? I no, remember exactly. It was during those days. It came to pass at the time when Eli was lying in his place, and the eyes began to blink dim, and it was before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was. Do you know that? Do you guys remember the church history and the setup of? All of that, yeah. So there was the ark, of, there was the inner room, there was the ark of the covenant, there was one thing, was the lamp that was lit inside of it. What was the representation of that lamp? What's always the representation of the oil? Yes, and the fire. Yes, it's the spirit. Yes, the spirit of God himself that dwelled there in that place. When it goes out, what was the representation of that? God ain't there no more. Yes, so that's why the Philistines, so when the Hebrews brought in, they thought that it would be the salvation for them. And this is another thing that was kind of twisted in their view. All of a sudden, the ark became the salvation instead of God being their salvation. Now, if you realize, though, too, though, that God's words were very few. So they were hearing things about God and about the ark of the covenant enough to know to go get it. And yet, at the same time, what they were hearing obviously wasn't the truth. Yes? And nor did they even consider that the lamb was out. Like there wasn't even a reality there. There was no awareness of even the Spirit of God. <coughs> and the two that brought it are the two sons. I know. So, yeah, go ahead. No, it's just amazing how the Philistines actually believed our God more than the people that were supposed to be. Yes. And they remembered all of the promises and the victories and the wonderful works of God that He had done yeah. for His people yeah. more than they did. And if you realize, guys, that this is hundreds of years after that stuff had actually taken place, and all those years of all the judges, yeah, that was happening in between this. The Philistines remembered And the Philistines remembered every bit of it. And God yeah. them and doing all Now, this. if you remember, Samson was no shy man about the promises of God and declaring to the Philistines as he ripped them apart. Don't. So they've been being reminded throughout these times. Yes, but they did believe it themselves more than which is just, it is. It's just amazing. Um, okay, uh, I, I need my page back. So where were we at? Uh, so definitely, okay. So we had the boys who had passed away. 
Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle lines the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now when he came, there was Eli, sitting on his seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told him, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. And the man said, Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? So the messenger answered him and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among all the people. Also your two sons are dead, and the ark of God kept them. Then it happened, when he made mention of the ark of God, that immediately Eli fell off his seat backwards by the side of the gate, and his neck was broke, and he died. For the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel for years. And so ends the ministry of Eli. And so begins the ministry of sin. You know, and, and again, if you look at well, you look at some of the other judges, and it's not necessarily the case. Some of the other judges, I mean, they these guys were dying at 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, even at that time. Now that doesn't mean that was like a normal lifespan, but remember too, like maybe it was kind of because of the slavery and the different things that was kind of going on. You know, I, I but um, if you look back at the lives of some of those judges, they they weren't they weren't like we were seeing before this, where it was six hundred years. 500 years, 1,000 years, 900 and something years, you know, we, we are, we're not seeing that now. His daughter-in-law, Phineas, wife was with the child, drew to be delivered, and when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she got herself and she gave birth, for her legal pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman, the woman who stood by her side to her said, Do not fear, for you have born a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Eshabah, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God had been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory of God has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. There's kind of a few different things within this. One is, is that she probably was aware of the promises of God, uh, what was coming down. One. Uh, second of all is that there's even, you know, the ark was always a representation of God's presence, yes? And uh, you see in other places, here was that there, the land, you see in other places, there was the smoke, all of a sudden it would leave the temple, and then um, the Philistines are different ones that were coming to war against them to be able to catch these things. Uh, you know, and in her mind, uh, that was the end of Israel, which is, you know, it's just We're, you know, I, wonder what was, I wonder what Hannah was believing at the same moment. Can't help. What, what Hannah was believing right here at the same moment. I mean, the fall of Eli. Well, I mean, okay, the, the, it looks like the fall of Eli, it looks like the fall of Israel, it looks like the fall of all these things, right? So here's Hannah, who. By all accounts of the way the world will look at it, she's cursed with God because she cannot have a child. But does she ever live the curse of God? Yeah. What does she always believe? Huh? Yeah. Okay. The promises of God, that God's for her, that God's got it all in hand, that God's going to take care of things. Yes? That's what she lives out, right? And it's just kind of interesting to see some of these other characters and what it appears that they're really living or not living. Is how God's still in control of all things, and He still has it. And we see over and over in the scripture, does God ever really leave? If you remember, um, just before this, there was another hero of faith. Yeah, he was a man who was scared. If you remember him, and he was hiding in the wine press. And if you remember that when God comes to him and he's hiding in the wine press, he tells God that he's angry with God because God let him. Do you remember what God's answer is? And he says, you left me and you left all of Israel. And you remember what God's answer was to Gideon. I have never left you. 
it was just you who have went away from my purposes. You've went away from my words. If you were believing that I was for you, then you'd be believing that right now while I'm here. So believe now. And then what does Gideon do? He believed, which ends up becoming 40 or something, it's 40 some odd years of peace. Yes, for all people, which means they were at peace with God. Yeah? So they were no longer against God, but they were believing God. Yeah? Based off of him, standing on that faith. Yes, and then he spread that faith to others. Ends up to the, all of Egypt, part of all of Israel, excuse me. Yeah? And so I know I don't want that question, guys, you know, I mean, it's not even here. But it just makes me wonder because, you know, Hannah showed faith all the way through, even though everything around her did not look that way. And, you know, it just, you know, God leaving God being there, God is always, He is, He is God. Yeah? And when the people were always believing God and testifying to God, guess what? Even the physical symbols God would give them so that they could be even more confident. Yes? But so God was always there. What was Sam what was Sam, what Sam been doing? <laughs> so was God there? Because God is in him. He's in his words. Which means he's going into the heart and the souls of men, those who are hearing those words. So was God still there? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? But their faith versus, you know, just the reality. In the ark and in well, the things that they could see instead of in him who they could not see. Yeah? Uh, guys, it goes on, uh, and uh, I do actually have, let me see, let me see, let me see. We have 15, 20 minutes, and always what we go to. You guys good? Good to push on the story? You are? This last little bit right here? Pretty fun. Because God has a great sense of humor. <laughs> you, guys, you guys want it? There's not a whole lot of anything more to say besides what it says right here, but he has a great sense of humor. You want to hear a sense of humor about this whole situation? Yeah. About the Philistines and Nebuchadnezzar versus, you know, everything? Yeah? Okay, so here we go. So the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it to Ebenezer and Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of David. David was their God, if you remember. There was another place where David and the statue and they burned it and stuff. I don't know if we went on that in this class. But anyways, David was one of their gods. And they, they set it by their god David, which was a statue, right? A big image. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was David, fallen on his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took David and they sent him back in his place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was David falling on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of David and both of the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold, and only David's torso was still left of it. Therefore, neither the priests of David nor any who come into David's house tread on the threshold of David and Ashdod even unto this day. So, what was happening? God, God made their idol fall down and worship. Anyways, yeah. So was God still? Was God there? Yeah. Even up to the point that the, that they him, their God Himself, what did they get? Ended up losing his head and his hands. So his hands, those things in which he could do. He no longer would be able to do. And the things that he would be able to say or think. <laughs> so all the things that they're God, God took. <laughs> kind of interesting. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he, he ravaged them and struck them with tumors. Now there's another translation for this, and guess what that translation was? Hemorrhoid. <laughs> because they were located in one general area. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. I've had to deal with them. They're not funny. Both Ashra and its territory. So they're in the city and all the surrounding land. Yes? And when the men of Ashra saw how it was, they said, The ark of God, Israel, must not remain with us. For his hand is harsh towards us 
and even towards David our God. Therefore, they sent and they gathered to themselves all of the lords of the Philistines. And they said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of God of Israel away. So it was, after they had carried it away, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the men of that city, both small and great, again with hemorrhoids, and it broke out all over them. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. <laughs> <laughs> so it was as the ark of God came to Ephraim that the Ephraimites cried out, saying, Oh my God, they brought the ark of God to this come here to kill us, all of our poor people. <laughs> so they've already heard at this point what's happening there really wherever it goes, and they're they're not wanting to do it. So they sent and they gathered together all the lords of Philistines, and they said, Please send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go back to its own place, so that it does not kill us or our people. For there was deadly destruction throughout all of the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with these tumors, and the, and the cry of the city went all the way up into heaven. Now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and all of their diviners, saying, What shall we do with this ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. So they said, If you send it away from the ark of God to Israel, do not send it empty. But by all means, return it to him with a trespass offering. With an apology. <laughs> then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you yet. Then they said, What is the trespass offering that we should return to him? So he said, You must give him five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. <laughs> the, the lords of the Philistines were what? And rats. And rats. And this is their old priests that are telling them, you want to make it right, you're going to have to recognize what you are before he died. Yeah? For the same blood was on all of you, and on, listen, the same blood was on all of you and on your lords. Therefore, you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land. Do you understand what, he, what these guys are calling them? Yeah. Right? Like over and over and over again? We already said it, but I mean like, how much more? And you shall give glory. And you shall give glory. You want this to stop? You, you worship these carved, carved images? Then you need to carve out the images of what you're worshiping. Which is the rats that go through and destroy your whole entire land, and the tumors, which are you. Yes? And you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps then, perhaps, he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods and from your land. So then why do you harden your heart like Pharaoh did in the Egyptians when Pharaoh hardened his heart? When he did not, when he did, when God did, he did mighty things among them. Did they not let the people go that they might depart? Now therefore, make a new cart. Take two milk cows, which have never been yoked before, and hitch the cows to the cart, and take the cows home, away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord, and set it on that cart, and put the articles of gold which you have returned, which you are returning to him, capitalized God, as a treasure, I'm sorry, as a trespass offering in the chest by its side. Then send it away and let it go, and watch. For if it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done, he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand which struck us, that it just happened to us by chance. 
So then the men did so. They took the two milk cows, they hitched it to the cart, they shut up the cow, the, their calves at home, um, they set the ark of the Lord on the cart, the chest of gold with rats and all the images of the tumors. Then the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, going as they went, and did not turn even to the side, to the right or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them all the way to the border. Just to make sure. Notice they weren't guiding them. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. Okay, I'm just going to stop right there, guys, because we're getting close to our time. But let, me, let me make this point. These priests even tell them, not only do you need to do all these things and kind of like, you know, put them under the fire, but what was, what was the... I'm just going to say, I'm going to sit and ask them. What the most unbelievable part to me was is their declaration that you must worship their Lord, their God. Yeah? What does God want for all of them? For all these people's sins? For them to hear what you say. For them not to harden their hearts. And even their own, even their own wise men were able to see that this man God just wants you to live. Just worship him. See what your God's got you. See what you live for yourself has got you. See what it's done for all of us. And worship their God. Yeah. And then I think it's kind of funny because they said, if he's nice, he'll lighten his hand on you. Yeah? Yeah, that shows a little bit of mercy. But guys, I just think it was it was neat and awesome, and God wanted them to see that He is God, that their gods were not. You guys know there's all of us in this world, and we all walk around, and we all fall into the serving of God of some sort, of some way. Yeah, and guys, man, there ain't none of those gods that's going to stand before the Lord. Yes, and as a matter of fact, all the things with their hands that we would want to think they can bring us or do for us, they're not going to. And whatever's persuasive words or this or that, the only thing it ain't nothing, it's a head cut off. The only thing that stands for everybody is the Lord. Yeah? So worship him. Yeah? I did I do think it's just guys, I mean, as we continue on through the scriptures, God does some some other really good ones like this, all right? So just I mean, again, he's quite he is awesome. Jesus is awesome. Um, you know, he has a sense of humor about it too. You know, um, you know, and, and he gets to make sure his point gets across. Yes, and um, you know, guys, if you realize though, each one, and like I said, with the Philistines, you realize this has been going on and on and on. Yes, these messages have been coming to the whole world and over. You can actually go back all the way uh, back. You see, you see, the days of Abraham, these messages were pretty rough. Yes. We see that at one point there were some Philistines that did jump to believe the Lord. One of them becomes a daughter of one of the sons. And I can't remember which one was what. Yeah? We see some of them end up getting saved. You know, through these messages. Right? And then, but, you know, God is God. And He is not going to, there, there will be no other gods before Him. He's God. And love Him for that, though, guys. Yeah? Love Him for being who He is. Yeah, he is an awesome guy. He's cool. You know, and you know, these kids want to talk about being cool in these stories and this and that and whatever. I mean, we ain't got you're gonna find nobody cooler. You know, you find nobody more awesome. I mean, who pits hemorrhoids on the statues and all the people and everything else? <laughs> I mean, you talk about a joke to play. <laughs> You know what I mean? And I mean, it wasn't a joke, guys. I mean, he was really trying to turn one from their unbelief of trying to believe that their gods was something to really turn to understand that he was the only God and he's the only God who's something. He's everything. Yeah. And that's how I, yeah, that's really the desire was for the deliverance and that salvation, guys. And it's really neat to even playing off, you know, again, kind of the humorous side of it. I mean, to me, it's funny. But, uh, like, his point, his purpose, it, though, was for the deliverance and the salvation, not for the destruction. Yes, and now they bring it to those who would not believe. Yes, you know Pharaoh continued to harden his heart, just would not hear 
the promises of God. Remember, when, those people, when the people started, the first request was just to go outside the camp and make an offer sacrifice. The Pharaoh said that. And what it ends up leading to is Pharaoh's destruction and how many hundreds of thousands of others, yeah? So you guys know, and believe the Lord, it's down in his promises. Um, when we come back, guys, uh, the ark's going to get returned uh, completely. And uh, we're going to stop picking it up on uh, Samuel's ministry, which is really taking off. Okay? And what's going to end up leading to the first king of Israel. Yes? And then, which leads to the first. Should, uh, it's hard to say this. The first king God gave him. And he was anointed by God. But he could never believe. He would never believe. So then what you would have is the next king, which is God's king. Yeah? It ends up being King David. Okay? And so that's where, that's why, again, there are Hebrews who list the heroes of faith, and he says Samuel, or David, and then Samuel. But I told you we had to hit Samuel first because that's you can't get to David if you don't have Samuel. If you don't have that leading. Yeah? So when we come back, the Mark's going to get um, back. Um, we're going to have Samuel um, pushing in his young ministry, um, leading into um, Saul, and then from there into David. Okay, so that's what we're going to be going in the next few weeks. Yes? And guys, like I said, we're going to spend quite a bit of time, guys, because there is a lot of literature, okay, on Samuel and David. But dang, is it good. And dang, is it neat. And the fun stories and crazy stories and sad stories. And I mean, you talk about, I mean, if you like comedy, you're going to get it. If you like drama, you're going to get it. If you like action, you're going to get it. I mean, if you like love stories, you're going to get it. You're going to get it all right with Samuel and David. Yes? You're going to get heroes of faith, Samuel and truth. You're going to get the greatest warriors that stand on still. You're going to get some of the greatest women. You're going to get a mixture of all of that and get your way into bringing the lineage. And it already has been, as we can see. But the lineage of Christ is being pressed forward um, to the birth of Christ and what is it become the New Testament church of the moment. Yes? So, guys, I love you. I uh, hope you enjoyed tonight. I hope you had a lot of fun with me. I had a lot of fun with you. And, uh,